Um, I'm going to note for the record that we are deferring the item on Pearl um, for a future work session. And our agenda tonight will cover promoting classes, scheduling registration of courses, track programs, and a discussion of our budget. So moving into the first item, Matt, take us away. Yep. So there's, uh, at the board table we've talked different times and um, I guess maybe back this up in the program of studies we presented to you, uh, several different courses that would be offered for the 19-20 um, school year, but two of, uh, I think, attention to the board were ethnic studies and uh, the start of an ag ed program. And so with us here this afternoon, we have um, Mr. Bacon from City High, Mr. Kimmy from Liberty, Dr. Schultz from West, and then uh, Mr. Carey, also one of the guidance counselors at City High, has joined us. I don't think I missed him, Bales. Uh, obviously, Brady's very involved with the leadership team at Liberty High and across the district with the Teachers Association, so he has some good background knowledge on this, too. But I thought maybe the best thing would be just to uh, give those gentlemen a chance to explain to you kind of what, what that registration process looks like in their building, what they've done to... Um, kind of advertise and market uh, not only these two new classes but kind of the general procedure for what happens when we do have a new class and uh, we've also talked about that delicate balance between other elective areas too and making sure that they also have their opportunity to highlight what they're able to offer to students and um, I would say just one thing of note I'm sure all three of the guys will talk about how their timelines have been bumped here a little bit with the weather as well and so I know that some of those processes probably haven't worked as ideal as they'd like in January just from the weather and having to delay some some dates and so that'll delay our ability to get in course requests for kids and be able to report back to you on what those numbers actually look like but um, with that I don't know John are you okay kind sure. of starting and jumping in thanks let's see well let's see we do a variety of different things in the registration process and then also speak specifically to highlighting the new offerings um, in general with the, the process there are small group the counselors lead small group meetings. Um, they go by grade level, and we just methodically work our way through um, using um, uh, a series of different small group meetings to the point that every student gets a chance to meet with a counselor. And they talk about the upcoming registration process, they talk about um, options and, and highlights for each grade level, um, and then uh, uh, they have sort of a, a sheet of talking points or highlights, and that would include anything that's new. So in a small group setting, the counselors are, are able to preview everything that's a new option um, and, and give special attention to those things. And so everyone is, is, is hearing that message. Um, we also did something special um, at Matt's uh, recommendation. We reached out to West Branch High School, um, who has a, a successful egg program and FFA chapter, and invited them to come out to City High during one of our advisory periods. And so for um, a couple of weeks leading up to that, we used our announcement system to um, advertise that that opportunity was going to be available to students. We said that that was an opportunity each day to, to plug the fact that there was this new course offering that was coming next year and that to help students learn about what, what this is all about, they could attend this informational session. Um, and so we had, I think, about 10 members of the of West Branch High School's egg program as well as one of their teachers come out during advisory and they led a really nice informational session for teachers. And so we've had a pretty extensive um, announcement period to, to give special attention to the fact that that class is happening. Um, in terms of ethnic studies, I would say um, uh, we've used announcements um, to uh, include that as well. Um, leading up to the grade level meetings, starting with students about the registration process, um, when we would, we would say highlights, in, I would say something like highlights include information about our new courses, including ag education and um, ethnic studies. So those are some of the steps that we've, that we've taken. Mr. Carey, I'll look at you now and see if I, how I summarize that, or That's if there's great. anything you'd want to add. You know, the only thing that I'd add is, uh, so we do that first informational meeting, then we do a follow-up meeting. Our seniors, we actually do, to be seniors, for juniors. We have one-on-one, -on -one <coughs> so we have the opportunity to, we're gonna start out the meeting by saying, hey, what are you thinking about after? And then try to, because there's so many offerings, and we know the curriculum inside and out, they know pretty well by the time they've gone to the meetings, but. We, we can encourage students who have specific interests that, you know, maybe they don't see the connection between a, a unique program, either the Kirkwood Regional Center or something like one of our new electives, so we can help them see that. So our, our seniors to be, our juniors now, we're one-on-one -on -one with them. So we'll be doing that over the next several weeks. And then our freshman, incoming freshman, incoming sophomore, incoming junior group, we meet in small groups. And again, we can 
we can do a little bit of that, but we see them all in 25 and 45 minutes, so there's not a lot of time there. The final thing is that we run parent meetings at uh, the parent-teacher conferences and make sure that the parents that want to come in, you know, unfortunately we don't we don't have gigantic crowds, but we, we offer informational meetings and they get the same PowerPoint the kids are getting and uh, an opportunity for question and answer afterwards. Our biggest session is always our, eight, our ninth graders with the eighth grade parents coming in from South East. So those are the only two things I would add in addition. Now, uh, with the parents, I understand that they can make more involvement in the elementary period as, as, as they matriculate through it plus one. Um, is there any type of an email that's sent out to parents that's like a part of notification on new course offerings or anything like that? Mrs. Holt sends out a weekly, I don't know if it's weekly, but very, very frequent uh, email with updates from the guidance office. So okay. those have a lot of information in them and included in there has been information on the courses. Okay. Not too different, I would say. Um, we we did our registration a little differently. Some of the basics about graduation requirements and things like that, we did in what we would call a flipped classroom. So that was all in an online presentation. And during one of our advisory times, we call it Liberty Time, the kids were expected to go on there and get that uh, information from their computer. And that way, when counselors went to classrooms to meet with kids, they could have more individual conversations as opposed to you know, tell them they need 310 graduation credits and that kind of stuff. Um, I physically went to one of those meetings so that I could verify and there was time spent on ethnic studies, a slide on part of their PowerPoint and a, a separate slide on um, our ag program as well. And so those were featured as those individual conversations with classes. Our counselors went to every single English classroom, 9 through 12. So for 9 through 11, we wouldn't do it with our 12th graders, of course. Um, so the kids got it that way. We've not been to our junior highs yet because we've been canceled twice. And so now we're going to go next Wednesday and we'll provide that information to them again. Um, we had a parent night two Wednesdays ago. We were supposed to have it tomorrow night, and now we'll have one next Wednesday night, and so we'll get that information out to those families as well. We we'll keep trying. We keep pushing that back. Um, the Ag and the Ethnic Studies course were specifically highlighted in my S'more newsletter. It had its own little feature, and so I did that early on. And then the other piece that I heard kind of in this question is our counselors sent out all the materials to families in a separate email then then from my s'more in terms of course of studies books here's the powerpoints that kids have been seeing and so all that went as well so we've been trying to kind of blast it as much as we can but we've got some work to do because of the weather still I guess it's my turn um, pretty much uh, a lot of the commonality <coughs> here uh, uh, one thing I've highlighted is we did put the ethnic studies in the uh, ag program I would also say that we brought some students over to meet the Secretary of Ag, uh, so um, they would talk about that experience a little bit and sort of get the word out. Um, the other thing is just to recognize that uh, you know, the underclassmen tend to fill up their schedules up with classmen don't. And um, so we've been really pushing the upperclassmen to um, be a little more aggressive with their scheduling, and uh, they're the ones who are looking you know, to target for Ag and the ethnic studies programs to get the numbers to the liability. Um, so, uh, like the other schools, you know, we are uh, meeting um, with the students. Various, well, because it's part of actually part of the process, but really came out of our equal schools as we look at trying to make sure we're increasing rigor for all of our students. Um, but it does provide that platform for talking about all of the things that they're taking. So, um, you know, this, the counselors have a chart. They, um, you know, with a preference, and they've been using that as talking points. And of course, the, the two new classes are part of the talking points. Um, in addition, you know, we did our. Um, I, it was just a, it was interesting to Liberty Time because I think a lot of my students think uh, that our intervention time is Liberty Time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering how uh, you know, maybe that name seeped over in some way, but. Um, uh, we used uh, that time as well for scheduling, and so uh, I, I did a presentation with uh, Paul Redbach, and uh, we sent out to everybody. And, um, we, 
spend you know a good you know a section of that on the ag and um, I guess that is, is a new course. Um, so it was a great turn off part of as we kicked off this is the registration time. So I guess that's what I would add for West Point. So question is this your standard process when a new course is introduced? What you just described? Pretty much the difference with this, the ag program is it's not in an existing department. Got it. You know, and so when that was sort of the difference, and really I think so you really kind of fits in the same because, um, you know, a, a little bit. I mean, uh, you know, in my case, you know, the teacher that, uh, you know, has helped develop it, Mira Nash, is an uh, ALL teacher, so she's not. A and so it, um, ordinarily, you, we, during this time, we have and the weather has kind of knocked this out of the ballpark too. But, as you're going to your science class, you learn about the science offerings during the week, all registration week. Yeah. And then, you know, and that has been a little bit of a disadvantage to the ag program because there's no department champion yet, right? Right. Yeah. So that's the difference. Uh, I think. So you have to do these other things with right. addition or mm -hmm. yeah. sort of to make up for that, you know, lack of Are they officially in Canada? Isn't the ethnic studies get a social studies elective credit? Yeah. Right. Is what's the is it getting a science or is it just a standalone? Yeah. yeah. So the career so tech, tech, career tech elective. Yeah. So, okay. but, there, but there are schools that are, you can get a, uh, a biology. Yeah, depending on how we end up building out course yeah. offerings, there may be some of the courses that would also, you know, that we could align up with biology or science elective credit potentially so but with the intro course it's it's mostly a, what you consider an elective credit form but, but yeah I think what Greg's point you know just you know, a lot of times when we start a new course there's kind of a champion in house for it right or somebody at least to go to and answer the questions and so I think that's why we've done some extra work on the newsletter on the communication end because there's not necessarily that person to go to and so we wanted to make sure people were aware of the egg offering um, the ethnic study one's been a little bit different, but it hasn't currently lived anywhere either. And so, you know, at least there's been some people that can answer that question. And it's had some also community attention, obviously, surrounding it with kids already asking about it and asking for it. And, and one question I had is, you know, with, with, with the uh, s snow times and the cold weather that we canceled school, has that slid? When, when is your deadline for uh, planning your schedules? Yeah, I mean, we were going to be done this week. I was just saying, we now we're, we're, we're already yeah, moving absolutely. it back a full week. So I think it would be a good push. Okay. You know, and you got to know that's where we like, we try to hit 80% by, say, week of Friday. Right. And then you spend another two and a half, three weeks getting the other 20%. Right. Yeah. Now, and, and one thing we found out with the ethnic studies course is that after they found out it wasn't there, we had a lot of people at the microphone coming up and saying, well, I would have taken that course right now. Uh, after students get, set their schedules, um, and who knows after spring and, and, and that, is there any way that a student can change it past that? What's the mechanism there? Uh, I mean, I imagine we all can do something a little different, but we, the students actually go online and put their preferences and what they, what, what they want. And then they go that with the counselor to make sure that those are fine. But the big thing is they also get these papers. And on the paper is where you have your alternates. Okay. And so that's when the, you know, the counselors will say, this class doesn't make, and there are classes that don't make, you know, uh, sometimes. And so then they'll look and say, okay, what, what's next on the list? Or the student who signed up for it, it gets slotted into a class for it that just doesn't work in their schedule right. for whatever right. reason. That's one of the challenges I think we have. Uh, classes that might have one section or even two sections only, you put it into a master schedule. If it's second period and fifth period, you're instantly going to get 20 kids sign up for it. You're probably losing 30 to 40 percent of students just with scheduling conflicts. And then, then I mean, there's a whole negotiation process that takes place. So it, everyone wants their master schedule, teacher, staff, measures, but it's usually May, June. Right. And, 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 and like, like, <laughs> later like, than we, well, we finalize in June. June is when they exactly. final, and then the kids will come back in August and they'll start bargaining. Bargaining, you know, yeah. but yeah, for differences. But it will be slowed down tremendously oh, just yeah. based on the conversation you're going to have at the end of the work session. I mean, that's yes. going to be the reality for us because staffing is going to be a, 
difficult puzzle for us to solve. So Absolutely. these guys will want to build their master schedule, and I'll tell them they can't, you know, because they won't know their staffing number, you know, as we'll continue to work through that process. And hopefully we'll be able to give them some of those answers. But, you know, the more st solid staffing is and they know what they can count on, the quicker they can yeah. go into master scheduling. And so some of that's going to be a continually moving target for us this spring to get and, to. And that was my question was going to be about, I don't know, if it's in the budget or this part, but, I mean, we're going to have to start looking at some things, and is there going to be a number that's going to be, this course is going to be offered if we have X number, or if it's under that? We're, I think the first we're, thing we'll do is complete the course request process. So kids go through from the program of studies, submit those those course requests, and then what we'll have to do uh, internally is is to look and say, okay, what do we have the staffing to offer? You know, what are the courses we have low request numbers on? And like Brady said, I mean, sometimes our, our most difficult ones to offer in that scenario are the ones that only have one or two sections, and are those the things that, you know, we need to move to the side? Do you have the staffing and the right certification of the folks still in your building to be able to teach it? Um, you know, what kind of FTE do we need to consider across the three high schools to do that? So some of those things, that'll be kind of the order it happens in. But the first thing is to get these requests in. Yeah, and, I, and we looked at these earlier. And I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind is when we go through that, we also have to think about offer and teach. So there's some things that the uh, Department of Ed requires us to have in our course catalog. And so you might have a few of those classes that live down there in that small tail. So we'll get the registration <coughs> in, and then once we have those in, we can sit down and look at them and better understand what the ramifications are. Uh, and one of the other things that Matt and I have talked about is there are times when you go through and you fill out a staff member's schedule and you've now got point eight of their schedule occupied and we've got two tenths that's still in their contract and that might align with one of those classes that they were otherwise assigned to teach which now wound up being small. Well, we may wind up offering that class in because that person's hold on as part of that process. So part of it's getting all the registration numbers in, taking a look at those. Once we understand where those are at, then we can start making some of those other domino decisions. But when you're in a, I would just say, when you're in a, this isn't a zero sum game situation, the things that we'll see later on in this work session. And so that does change the dynamic, you know. So in a zero sum game, you're going, okay, if we ran these two that are new, something else is gonna take a hit. But when you're not going to, it's gonna be challenged from the things you already offer, that does, I just think the board has to, take that into consideration, it's going to create a very, very profound challenge. Right, and, and to that end, um, on the ethnic studies, I know earlier on we were, we were looking at bringing an ins uh, uh, instructor in for that course. Is that still no. the goal we're going to be using? Stat so so that's the type of a thing like you're talking, you, you, it may just be uh, a small section of what that, that teacher does uh, that way with the ethnic studies. The, and with the ag education, um, like we've said, the challenge is we don't have anybody to help promote it. Um, they do offer dual citizenship for, or not dual citizenship, <laughs> dual certification uh, for, for those instructors. So, it, you know, if, if you do have, and, and the challenge is going to be at three schools with one instructor. So there's a lot of challenges with this program. And, uh, but they do also would have the ability to teach a, uh, a science or a biology, biology. That, that biology that way. So it, you know, like we're, we're talking, it may be 80% uh, one, 20% the other to, to make the FTE, that type of a thing. Uh, but, uh, and, and with that one too, it's unique because it's year round curriculum. Yeah. Well, if you're at all three schools, they have to be 1.0 FTE, I think, with travel time. Okay. Yeah, you, I mean, I agree, in the future that would be absolutely, you could do it, but if, if you were running it, if you're just thinking through the contract, if you're running it, the same person doing three different work sites with their travel time, that would be their sole assignment. Yeah, they'll teach one section at all three. Yeah, that would fill out their FTE. So, so they teach three of them. So, yeah. so I think we're I very naturally pivoting to budget conversation. Is there anything else on the promotion and registration that we want to make sure we get out of the table is context? The only thing I would say, too, is there is a lot of, I mean, it's a, it's hard to capture just in this brief amount of time how much work goes into it on the part of the counselors, the administrators, and the teachers. I mean, it's a full week of conversations with students, and typically we'd have our uh, conferences during the middle of it, and I knew my wintertime conferences with families were going to be dominated by uh, maybe a fourth of how they're doing right now, but then three quarters of what should they do next year. And so that's, you know, our schedule is a little bit off 
just because of the weather, but there is, it's, it's a considerable amount, and students and families are quite savvy in the decisions that they make, so it is really hard to pin down why they're doing one thing in particular or not the other thing that we think they might. There's a whole host of uh, factors that go into that line screen, so uh, just, I just want to say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a pretty extensive process. And from the, the parent side of it, it's, it's the fault that that hat on, you know, as a registering junior, right? To me, it feels so rushed. And part of that's because my kid doesn't want me to be a part of it anymore, right? <laughs> so, it's like, here's my sheet, sign the sheet, I got to turn it in tomorrow, right? It kind of plays out that way, no oh, matter yeah. how much I pester him to get him to But, um, and I know, as you're saying, it's how much work it is, and you're starting at the end, like building the mass schedule and mm -hmm. trying to hit all these deadlines leading up to it, so you can do that. Yeah. But from the parents, it's like, oh my God, I, I just got the list, and now I got to get it in. Really, yeah. It feels very fast for me. Yeah. Um, I never, you know, at the junior high level, you have very few options as to what you can do. So I never felt that rush there. But because maybe that's it. There's so much at the high school level, particularly once you get to you know, upper class. I mean, yeah. There's so many things out there. I don't feel like as the parent I have the time to yeah. digest it. Meanwhile, my kid said, no, this is what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just done. No, I, we gave He probably filled it out online before he even like, told you, Sean. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but sure. to Phil's point, you, there's no buyer's remorse on that. You could change that at any time with the conversation. Yeah. And yeah, I, don't know. I think the conference. <laughs> I think that's where conferences. Not having them, at least at a couple of the schools, I think a lot of that conversation with family members or our parents and guardians happens with teachers. Yeah. We have that chance. And we have been more aggressive in our timeline with the EOS work. That has bumped yeah. our timeline up, you know, um, into that January time frame. Uh, with doing the student surveys in the fall and then coming back with EOS, trying to get the course requests. Uh, for potential AP uh, students so that we have some time to follow up with them in the spring for that same reason you're talking about, Phil, about it. If a student wants to change their mind or amend their course requests, they're able to do that. So, you know, to your point about that, it is bumped up in earlier into the school year a little bit. Um, yeah, but it's a lot. I mean, Tom and his colleagues, I'll just give a shout out. He's here on the, on the inclement weather day, but they do a fantastic job <laughs> over the city and all the counselors. So, so. I would just throw, not from the parents side of things, I know uh, they get emails here like, when did it become our job to even promote classes? Like, why is that a thing, right? And it came, it is a thing, right? And I know it was very, uh, it was very real when we had all those students marching up front and had for two years begged for a class and then they thought they were going to have it and then for many reasons it didn't happen. Right? And it was it was very tangible feel at that moment that we failed and we needed to do a better job of it. And I think it's not so much uh, promoting it and trying to sell it to, you know, to kids, but I, I, a lot of, I think the failure was around the timing and the effective communication, um, both ahead of the class and then after it was decided that it wasn't happening, like all of that was not done well. And so I think regardless of how many kids you get in class, because at some point we're going to have class but there's not going to have enough kids to be in the class. Whether it's these new ones or something else, somewhere there's going to be one that's not going to happen. I think effectively communicating with enough time to the students that here's what's going to happen now, here's why, and here are your options, I think we can do a better job of that. Because that very specific instance, a year and a half ago, the ethnic studies did not go well. And you know, that, I think that's what we've learned. That, that's a, the lesson learned from that one was that it needs to be in what they just described, yeah. which is our regular cycle, so yeah. that teachers yeah. in the classroom are talking about it, counselors are talking about it, it's coming in the, the newsletters, it's in the program of studies, so that there are multiple touch points to it. We learned the lesson of doing things off cycle doesn't work. One of the many reasons that that yeah. it faltered. Yeah. That's why I think we were starting to go. We started to go down that route with the ag offering, and I think we kind of pulled it back to make sure that we did go through the process a little more fully and get the curriculum yeah. set and things like that, so it would have a better chance of getting off on the right foot from the get go. So I guess we'll see how many kids sign up and what was that. 
so should we pivot to budget? I know the trek was the next item on the agenda, but this but budget feels like the, the next natural conversation. I think trek's a pretty short conversation. Yeah, if you just want to agree. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. I think we just wanted to update you guys on um, kind of what we're doing internally a little bit as we look at uh, Trek programs and more, more importantly I think the students served at Trek. Uh, we have anywhere from about 25 or even 20 to 30 students served at the Theodore Roosevelt Education Center throughout the year and what we're really trying to do is just go back to a least restrictive environment philosophy with all students there, not only the IEP students but the gen ed students that are served there as well. And uh, considering our, our home campuses, uh, considering uh, Tate Alternative High School, and trying to look at what options we have uh, to continue to deliver on a high level of service to those students. And so internally, we've talked um, with the Trek Administrator, John Nitty, Lisa Glenn from the Special Education Department, Ian Browning. Uh, we've had some updates to our high school principals. They'll continue to have some more updates here as we go through the spring. But um, really trying to look at um, what is that LO, least restrictive environment we can continue to serve those students in. Um, is that a standalone program? Is that a program um, relocated to either a comprehensive campus or to an alternative campus? Um, I think those are all options for us to consider as we look at those TREK programs. So I know there's been some questions. There's been newspaper articles written about it. I've been over to talk to the staff at TREK a couple times. Um, and I think we just wanted you in the loop or the ability to ask any questions you might have about that. Now, the, the 25 students you're saying that are in track, are they uh, Phoenix students? No, the Phoenix program is at Tate. Okay. So the, the students that you're, you're saying... Uh, this would be their, their day program. So the students that are served at track, they go there for their, for their school day. Okay. The Phoenix program would be... Um, students coming in to try to make up courses. Um, oh, could be during so, the day, but it's so at some, night. But some of that 25 team. could be students that are serving out of suspension there and, and getting caught up in their class studies, correct? Or, or, or am I? We, uh, we do have a long term suspension program okay. or even uh, some shorter term suspensions that if a student is uh, suspended and it's deemed to, you know, we want them on in school, not at home by themselves, but maybe not on their home campus, that they would go serve out their suspension there at Trek for a period of time. Really, the 20 to 30 students I'm talking about are the students that go there for an extended period of okay. time. All right. And that could be a long-term suspension scenario. We don't expel students, so right. if we've had a student commit a serious offense in one of the home schools and we come to a voluntary agreement with that student, they may finish their school year, a full academic year there, something along those lines. Right, and, and to that end, um, you know the, the students at uh, Tate uh, are have have not. You know that's our alternative. They they didn't fit in the uh, the bigger model. Uh, taking the students from Trek and putting them at Tate isn't that. Are we going to have some issues there with uh, that? Uh, just my conversations over there with the staff at uh, Trek. Uh, when I visited, they they like the fact that it's kind of unique. It's off by itself. Uh, the students are there and they're not in with the you know, a, a, another larger group, I'm just, you know, if you can talk to... Yeah, I think the one thing we students. have to remember is that all those students were in our home buildings at one time first, <laughs> right? Agreed, right, right. So right. they've all been on a, one of our home campuses and we've all, you know, been able to serve them on some level before. Uh, if the students ended up at Tater Trek, you know, there's been lack of success for one reason or another. Maybe it was behavioral um, issues that got in their way, maybe it was lack of academic success and credit failure, and then those accumulated on them and we served them at Tate, you know, to, to try to recover credits and do that. And so there's, there's a variety of reasons those students are at Trek. It's a, it's a small number of students. Um, I think there's some abilities for us in a standalone program to put some things in place for them to help them be successful that we would be ignorant not to consider about how do we have to replicate those things to help them be successful in a new environment. Um, and so if that's a direction we're going to move, that's some of the collaboration that has to happen for us internally for each of our uh, administrators to be talking through is about what has helped those students be successful at Trek. We have some great success stories coming out of there, right? I mean, we have a high uh, service delivery model there uh, that has uh, parents have reported that are being very successful. Uh, but there's also some concerns we have about being able to offer a holistic program, in a sense. And um, when we have special ed dollars going into that building and we have gen ed dollars, we have to be very careful about how we're blending those programs, and we haven't always got that right. And I think that's something we need to pay special attention to. And then from just an economy of what we can offer to those students, they all deserve a highly qualified teacher in every subject area. And where we're trying to do that in a 25 to 30 student school versus whether it's a 150 student school like Tate or in our large high schools at 1,500 students, 
you know, there's some economies of scale we can't create there at Trek, which I think that's some areas we're looking to improve, but then also we don't want to take away the supports that help those students be successful. So that's the balancing act we're trying to work through and, and interplay right now, and, and we hope we'll come out with a good good model to present back to you. And, and, uh, and uh, Tate is the regional alternative yes. high school, and I, I remember the last time we were there and had a, had a uh, Ed committee or whatever it was, uh, there was a waiting list to get in. Um, with these students coming over, is that going to make the waiting list longer, or is, you know, is there space uh, for this plus the uh, uh, original uh, goal of, of what uh, Tate is supposed to do? Well, so if we consider that some of the students at Trek have IEPs, the first thing we need to do is deliver on what's stated in their IEP. And so whether or not we talk waiting list or not, we have an obligation for those students to meet whatever statement in their plan. Sure. And then we answer the question of where that best happens. And so no matter what enrollments look like in those areas, we have an obligation to say, this is what the team decided you need, this is how we can deliver on that service, and then we answer the where question about where that is. And so that's where, it, if it's Trek, if it's Tate, if it's West High School, City High School, we determine that after the fact. I think your point about, you know, we've continued to operate an alternative high school with about the same number of seats as our large high schools have continued to grow. That's something I've talked to these three guys about. Um, but I think part of that, it can't just be looked at how many seats do we have at the alternative high school. We have to look at MTSS systems inside the building. Are there things that Tate's doing that we need to replicate on our home campuses? We've continued to do that and seen success with that. Um, I would also be lying to you to say if we're going to consider 25 students and you're going to put them on the campus and we have a full campus right now as we see, you know, what are those things we're going to have to talk about with that. Um, I think part of that has to do with the Tate design we're working through, you know, that we'll have to eventually talk to you about, about what does that look like for the new classrooms or new addition that, that Tate is getting. If we're going to serve some of those students at Tate Alternative High School, then what does that look like and does that create some more opportunities for us to be able to do that based on um, the facility improvements they're going to have there. So it's hard to answer any of these questions in isolation because sure. there's so many factors right. of, of well, what we're doing. It's a, it's a yeah. lot of dominoes. And and just for my own uh, information, with the uh, with it being a regional alternative high school, what what if any obligations do we have to create space for our partners? So you guys are presented a, a MOU every every year from me that talks about our agreement with that it's the same students that are or excuse me the same school districts that access the Kirkwood Regional Center and so we agreed to be the regional alternative high school and if they can't program for their students then they have the ability to request to have that student placed at Tate um, that's not something where they can mandate that placement to happen at Tate uh, that's something we work in a collaboration with them so most most often we work with Clear Creek through that process um, Sometimes Solon, sometimes West Branch if they have a student. Um, but that's also a space available conversation and we try to work through that. Um, most of the time that's a very small number of students. It's not something that's impact our ability to be able to serve our own students in the, okay. in the school district. All right, thank you. I think if it ever got to that point, we would definitely look at that. Okay. So, more come? Yep. Sorry. I don't think that was as short as we made it. So. <laughs> 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 I do have a So, with this TREK program, obviously moving out, homeschool moving out, at what point will we need to have a discussion about what to do with that building slash land? Shortly thereafter. Yep. <clears throat> so, that was a conversation that we had back in 2011, so we will have to revisit that. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Um, now, budget. I'm sure board members. Okay. Whisper to me, they got good news. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't spent the day with him, Brady. Have they set supplemental state aid since we've been sitting in here? Did I miss that? So this is essentially the same slide deck. The only thing that's different on here is the first page. All right. Um, and uh, I'm going to show it to you big like this so you got it, but then I'm going to zoom in so you can see a little bit better. No. We just need to pull it on the computer. First thing I want you to see is down at the bottom, this number here. So that's the gap between where we need to be and where we are. So right now, we've identified a 1% supplemental state aid. I know the governor has told us 
I've been in Des Moines. I've had the opportunity to talk to legislators locally. Um, the big part of the problem is there is a way to pay for that and mental health and several of the other things that are in our state of state address. So um, there's some real concerns that uh, we're going to be able to hit a mark above 1%. So when we built our budget, uh, that's what we looked at. That gives us a deficit of $6.176 million. Now what if that came to be and 2.3% was passed? That would generate about an extra one and a quarter million dollars for the budget. So you would reduce this deficit number by one and a quarter. So take it down to about five. Okay, so 2.3% supplemental state aid does not solve our problem. It does help, but it does not solve the problem. So uh, if you remember the last time we were together and we were talking about this and we looked at the slide deck. Um, hey Steve, quick question? Yes. On that bottom, so. We're assuming 1.1% 1. 1, 1 gets us at 83, so someone in the room with really good math on what would we have to have added on to that 1% to eliminate that 83,000 $83, dollar difference? Uh, well, if we got the... 1% is yeah. a million dollars, something else. Something yeah, so else. they gave us 1.2, we'd be in good shape. So we would need 6% from the state. To well, I think he just wanted to raise the 83. 83. Another 0.1%. Yeah, another tenth. Would do that. Uh, so since we were last with you, uh, we shared uh, several target areas for reduction. I wanted to bring you up to speed on that. And also give you a little bit of context. Recognize this is still a, a work in progress and we're going to continue to bring uh, updates to you as we get closer to the certified budget. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of the early retirement window right now. We extended it. Uh, it was uh, due to close last Friday. Uh, we have extended it through February 14th. Uh, one of the issues that we had was we have a number of employees who qualify for an annuity in lieu of insurance. The state says that out of the management fund, uh, you can pay a retirement incentive, but it must be a continuation of benefits. Uh, we had people who received the annuity who wanted to get into our health insurance plan uh, as part of the retirement package, um, but we validated that they were unable to do so because that's not a continuation of benefit. Uh, there was some concern on their part about uh, uh, how that uh, played into their annuity. We were able to make a, a determination that uh, we can comply with the requirements of the management uh, fund uh, uh, requirements of the state statutes and still offer them an incentive for their annuity. And so because we were able to open that up for them, uh, we want to give them a couple extra weeks to consider that. Um, I will tell you that uh, one person yesterday at the listening post that I was at indicated that he'd already turned his uh, retirement form in as a result of that. So right now, it says 34. If you would look to the right, you'll notice in that last bullet, there are an additional seven special ed teachers who have taken early retirement. They are not included in that 41 because they're paid for out of categorical funding. But I'll give you the caveat, and you'll see this down below. Where possible, we will be using all opportunities to move funds from the general fund into categorical funds so we can preserve teachers in the classroom. So it is within the realm of possibility that we have some uh, teachers who have special ed certification who are currently in general funded positions who may be transferred into those open special ed positions, which would then create a space behind them in a generally funded position, which then could be uh, considered as part of our budget reduction so then we could recoup the savings for them. However, until we've done staffing, we don't know that yet. Um, so we have 34 uh, that are in the general fund that we know uh, will be uh, will recover about 1.2 million dollars uh, towards our budget reduction uh, as part of their retirement. The other seven we'll know as we get farther into staffing. Uh, we uh, another document that you have, which we're going to uh, take a look at in a minute, uh, is our weighted resource allocation model. Uh, one of the benefits of using the weighted resource allocation model at the elementary level is it's built on formulas. Uh, so we were able to take a look at the formula there uh, and do some adjustments to it. By doing that, um, we're able to reduce 21 FTE at the elementary level. I think it's important to put that in perspective. If you look back in 2015-16, we had approximately 431 teachers. 16-17, we went up to 452. 17-18, we went to 468. Uh, and uh, just as a reminder, for those of you that weren't here with us, we phased into the RAM model. So that's part of that phasing process. Uh, so this year we have 480 FTE at the elementary level. Uh, so a reduction of 21 uh, takes us back uh, to approximately 460 
you can see that puts us kind of in between the 16, 17, 17, 18 staffing level. Not ideal. If you remember from our last conversation, I said that we're going to have to do less with less. Um, so we are going to have fewer teachers. Um, we will see a, a slight increase uh, in our FTE at the elementary level, and I'll show you that when we get to the RAM model. Same thing at the secondary level. We've got a target there for potentially 21 FTE in reduction. Again, looking 15, 16 to today, you see it go from 255 to 258 to 284 to 304. Uh, and so uh, if we reduced it by 21, we'd be back to the 17, 18 staffing levels. Again, not ideal. As Paul alluded to earlier, part of our process as we move through registration, we'll be looking at those numbers, making some determination uh, for faculty allocation at our seven secondary buildings. Uh, we have, in the next two categories, uh, looked at categorical funding in the district. Uh, two of the large areas of categorical funding that provide some flexibility for us are Title I and dropout prevention. Uh, in Title I, uh, we've looked at our staff uh, that are currently uh, being deployed under those funds. Uh, one of the other alternative uses for Title I funding is class size reduction. Uh, one of the things that you need to have to uh, use that money for class size reduction is a bona fide model uh, that's based on a rationale which is very similar to our rated resource allocation model. Um, so that allows us to move staff into uh, buildings that uh, are covered under weighted resource allocation model. Uh, by doing that, uh, we can move eight FTE in there, which saves us about $700,000 uh, on the, um, uh, the general fund. Uh, that is not without consequences. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is what happens with our reading instruction model at the elementary level. And Diane and Amy have spent a lot of time looking at how we would reallocate resources in Title I uh, to continue to meet the needs of our students, uh, but recognize that we're going to have uh, fewer resources for um, reading assistance at the elementary level than we do uh, at this time. Dropout prevention is much the same way. There are lots of things that you can spend dropout prevention dollars on. Uh, one of the things that uh, was uh, changed at the state level a couple of years ago was the fact that you can use dropout dollars to help pay for school counselors. Uh, it's a percentage basis uh, based on the number of students that they work with. Uh, and so we've gone through that process and we're able to allocate uh, approximately five FTE of counselors that can be paid for out of dropout prevention. Uh, and uh, also some additional uh, support staff or additional staff that we can pay for out of dropout prevention. If you look on the right hand side, one of the things though that we are going to have to take a look at, and we do not have this uh, uh, fully uh, determined yet, but areas that are likely to experience an impact from this reduction in available funds under dropout prevention uh, include programs like, and these are examples because we have not made the determination yet, IJ, the Workplace Learning uh, Program, Student Family Advocates, Secondary Academic Support, Elementary Academic Support, Secondary Reading Teachers, Elementary Behavior Support, Secondary Behavior Supports, Credit Recovery Program. Those are all programs that are currently funded with FTE uh, under dropout prevention. Uh, but obviously, as you can see from the, the numbers there, uh, we can move approximately a million dollars from current general funded positions into dropout prevention, but then we're going to have to displace programs that are currently in there. So between those two programs, we can move about $1.7 million uh, out of our general fund expenditure and into categorical funding, uh, but we will be losing some programs as a result of that process. But again, based on the conversation we had last time, if the core work that we do is that dyad between the teacher and the student in the classroom, then the thing that we want to spend our uh, greatest effort preserving is uh, teachers in classrooms with kids. So none of these are good choices, uh, but they do provide an opportunity for us uh, to prever preserve our maximum FTV in the classroom. Steve, what, yep. what is the amount we, uh, like an annual amount we get for dropout prevention? If you're moving a million dollars from one to that, Ooh, how I much is the one? I have that available on the spreadsheet. Yeah, that. Yeah. Is it? Five? About six million. Yeah, that's the closest. Okay. That's a pretty good chunk of it. Yeah, and title is 2.2, just to give you some yeah. perspective. It's 2.4, but we've got a couple hundred thousand dollars that's uh, mandated allocation for title. Uh, a couple other things that we're looking at uh, are building, building budget supply. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've tried to move some uh, of the things that uh, used to be under the building supply allocation the, uh, to different budgets. Uh, so uh, again, not ideal, but an opportunity for us. 
third party contractors. To date, we've already been able to reduce $136,000 worth of contracts. We're still looking for more. Uh, these are contracts that uh, uh, have been paid for in the 1819 school year. We plan not to pay for in the 1920 school year. So we're still uh, continuing to work with our uh, team to identify all the current contracts that are out there, dollar values, expiration dates, and which ones we can evaporate between now and the end of June. And then the last one on there is transportation. And I know that the uh, Transportation Advisory Committee is meeting the 6th. Is that right? But they'll meet uh, before the next board meeting so they can give an update at the board meeting. Uh, we've asked them to take a look at attendance support uh, transportation routes. Uh, just a reminder that uh, busing is both a general fund and a PEPL fund. Uh, and so uh, the allocation, I know a lot of times people think about a bus costing uh, 50000 uh, bucks, but part of that uh, is allocated to the general fund, uh, and part of that is allocated to the PEPL fund. Uh, the part that we count that's allocated to the general fund is $29,000. Uh, so right now, uh, the general fund allocation for discretionary uh, tenant support routes is $344,000. Uh, we set the goal for the advisory committee to look at uh, a potential reduction in routes of up to four, which would save us $116,000. Yes, Phil? Uh, to, well, to that end, we just had a discussion where we have one school that may not open on time, and we, we're, we're, we may have two bus schedules into this mix as well. I, 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 I know you're, you guys are looking at that, but there's probably, and I'm, I'm assuming you guys are going to have like, okay, this is, this is our optimistic what we can get out of it, and then this is the worst case scenario if we have to, have to switch, the, have drastic changes halfway through the year. Yeah, and actually, I, uh, from where it stands right now, uh, uh, when we look at grant and we look at grant opening and remember who goes to grant, uh, and we think about the Penn and the, uh, the uh, Garner Elementary students that are there right now, uh, uh, if we are to house those students where they currently live until they are able to move into their new house, um, obviously we'll make it some transportation route efficiencies at the beginning of the year. Uh, before we break them up into three. But right now, as Craig's going through and, and going through the bidding process, we're operating under the assumption that it does open um, so that that way, if that comes to pass, we're prepared for it from a budget standpoint. So, if, okay. We have reductions if it opens on time. Is what you're saying? Yes, we may. Right. Yeah, we've talked about okay. that. Great. We've talked okay. about that. Obviously, it's not optimal to do that. Uh, but there are certainly some opportunities that we have to save some money in the short term um, if the, the school isn't ready to go. Right. And with this uh, attendance support busing, uh, is that that McKinty Vento? No, uh, that's the homeless busing. This okay, is the busing so that we provide for students. Remember the, the Transportation Advisory Community met and identified okay. neighborhoods that absent uh, busing might have attendance problems. And so we send buses into those neighborhoods even though they're within uh, the one to two mile uh, radius. Okay. So if things came to pass today, if this was the budget that we presented to you today, we'd still be $83,000 short of making our mark. Uh, and uh, what we would like to do is, is first of all, uh, make sure that we keep you up to speed on the discussions that we're having because we don't want to bring you something that you look at and say, that's not palatable, we can't do that. And that's one of the main reasons that our tenant support bus is on here because we know that uh, the committee is going to talk about that and then it's going to be back in front of the board. But uh, we're close to making our mark uh, and uh, we're hoping that A, supplemental state, state aid gets set here in the very near future. B, we get some of our staffing work done uh, at the uh, secondary level. C, uh, working with Amy, we actually get all of our uh, elementary attendance numbers in, which we will know by March 1st. They'll all have turned their paperwork in. and working ahead of time on that. Uh, because then that gives us an idea of where we're at for staffing uh, at the elementary level. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to remind you that there are a whole list of things that were considered as we went through that brainstorming process of the Administrative Council. I just gave so that to you. To, so things that are additional considerations are things that are not being considered. They're not on here right now. Uh, those are things that were raised as we sat together as a group of administrators, and I literally said to them, everything you can think of, put on this yeah. list. So, uh, one so, question I ask, right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, obviously it's fairly grim when we're talking about this level of staff reduction. I, I think 
something you all, I'm sure, understand this. But we're still waiting to see what the registrations look like because we don't know what courses are going to go and not go. But I'm just curious if we have a sense of impact to students in terms of course offerings or services or programs and how those impacts play out proportionally across our student population. So I would hate for this to disproportionately affect our most vulnerable students. Um, and, and I it, I just, you know, the thought of prevention, I mean, all those programs there, right, are for some of our most needy students. I'm sorry, that's not a great way to say it, but you know what I mean? Yep. So I would love to see that, is there some way to view this across our demographics and student populations to see proportionally how they're affected? Uh, well, I can tell you that the drop-off prevention uh, budget in and of itself and the Title I budget uh, in and of itself, as you look at them independently, are most likely to hit uh, uh, students who have needs that are currently served that are in areas that, whether at the federal level or the state level, have been targeted for additional assistance. Uh, but uh, the other thing that I would tell you is that, um, for instance, at the elementary level, if you look at the, the sheets that's up here right now, um, this is the sheet that Amy and I use as we go through staffing for the RAM process. Um, and you can see that last year um, we had a, a 20.9 overall uh, average uh, elementary class size. Next year it would be 22.6, so we do see an increase there. But um, one of the things that we are able to do through this process is preserve RAM staffing. So we are still keeping class sizes uh, in our neediest buildings at That's the smallest the kind of levels. That's the yeah. I want to be able to see yeah. on, the, on the impact and I'd argue the same thing at the secondary level. Uh, we could, ultimately, you, you could simply say, I'm unwilling to go through the sacrifice that would be required to cut the $1.7 million out of title and dropout. And then what you would see, remember 84% of our dollars goes to people. No, I, You'd I, see these numbers I go totally, up. I totally get yep. that. So our, our conversation has been at the secondary level, is it more important to preserve FTE that keeps class classes available and class sizes smaller versus the dropout prevention and it's a horrible conversation to have is the only way I can say it. I know, it's grim. Yeah. Try to do both to the least, you know, I mean it's like the least worst decision, right? So if you dumped it all in, you know, uh, secondary certified staffing reduction, well those, all those numbers I presented to you today are just going to skyrocket, so right? So partially what you're saying is you've already kind of looked at this we're trying it's to do a balancing a act. Yes. We've got to take some certified staff. We've got to keep some certified staff. got to take some dropout. got to keep some dropout. Same thing with title. We're going to take some of it, but we're going to keep some of it. So we've made compromises in there. I mean, literally, when we first looked at it, we said, what if you just lop all of this off? Uh, and, and that's usually not a good scenario because there's some things that come from dropout or come from title that we want to keep in play. Uh, and so what we did was we said, okay, what do we have to keep in play? And then that, what does that give us in terms of available dollars that can be displaced? And then part of it too is keeping in mind that, you know, if, if we come around the corner, if staffing picks up, if we get some decent supplemental state aid in the next couple of years, if our growth gets back on track with where it was before, then how do we reintegrate these programs back into the work that we're doing in the district with the least disruption possible? Right. So one of the concerns is if you reduce staff dramatically, either at the elementary or the secondary level, uh, it's harder, whether it's at the secondary level, to build up content area uh, and courses that are offered if you just immediately, if you just jettison those staff at the elementary level. Um, when you think about the logistics and the structure of the school, if you jettison a whole bunch of staff, uh, it makes it harder to add that back in. So if we lose some of our dropout programs and we lose some of our title programs and then over time we're able to grow those back in, we also looked at that from a long-term perspective. I was kind of thinking the same thing, Jan, as I was looking at the numbers at the bottom, like here where we're at with 1% and you get lovely 2.3%, here's where we're at. And I think every 0.1% that you get above one, that's 100 grand, and I would sit there and find the chunks of 100 grand that probably mm -hmm. are going to disproportionately affect some of our students over the other and be like, all right, that's the first one that we're not going to do. Right. We've got an extra 100 grand. And here's you get another extra 100 grand, great, we'll find another one. Um, I'd like to say we take it all out because magic's going to happen in Des Moines, but any, any little bit over that one million makes the conversation less and less ugly, but I don't Still think it's ever going to get. Well, and what we hope is that we come to you over the next few weeks uh, and you get new iterations of, of this chart, we'll know supplemental state aid. We'll have a better understanding of, of how our students are allocated at the elementary level and what our staffing truly looks like. We'll know what registration looks like at the yeah. secondary level. We can look at it. Yeah. So, Jan, I'm curious, 
So how do we make the decisions on the reductions? I mean, what sort of process is it based on enrollment of courses or like just so, it's a whole question, but how do you guys go through this process? Let me give you a so which, reduction, which reduction? The cost reductions or the staff reduction? Staff reduction. So there's a couple of different pieces because, um, well, at staff reduction at the end of the day is set up for us in state code and in our collective bargaining agreement. And so it would be by seniority if we get, okay. to, if we get to that point where we actually act to um, rip staff. But short of that, we have to go through another whole um, kind of discussion in terms of placement because we know there will be changes between buildings uh, at the elementary level and at the secondary level. So then we have to look at certifications, yeah. but the agreement gives us a little more flexibility and it's based on need of the building, uh, where the staff member is, the need of the building, where the staff member would go, what the staff member certifications are, and so there's a whole number of different factors that we have to consider. And so we have to look at both of those. Um, and quite frankly, given the timing where we do this, and the principals don't want to hear this, but uh, nobody does, we could potentially have to go through that process twice. Because we're going to do a lot of our movement of staffing in March and try to get people slotted based on course enrollments and where we are. But if the RIF deadline isn't until, isn't until the end of April, if we then have to actually lose teachers, we might have to reshuffle those decks again because the people that are left might not line up with the certifications we actually had them in earlier in the spring. And so it's kind of this revolving. That's why we're hoping things like an early retirement deadline yeah. and hopefully setting yeah. supplemental state aid, the more of those pieces get locked in, then as you said earlier, the clearer our picture gets. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that uh, Chase has talked about the people, if you think about it from a numbers perspective, you know, one of the things that we will have to do collectively as a team, Amy and I have already talked about this, you know, we've got aspirational goals that are set um, where we know where they're at. We're going to talk about that uh, when we get to the next board meeting under that weighted resource allocation model. But right now, we tend to use those as a pretty firm tip over point. So if we're saying we're trying to keep a class under 30 kids and we get the 31st kid in there, We've been pretty aggressive the last couple of years of saying we're going to add another teacher to that grade level and make that a class of 15 and 16. That's going to be a little bit more sensitive this year for us, and we're going to have to look a lot closer at that 31st kid when there are 30 in there um, because of the implications that that, that has for staffing. Um, at the, you made the point a, a couple of times now, when we get those registration numbers in, you saw those long tails yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at the secondary level. We're going to have to take a look at those. Are there classes that we might have to say that's going to have to be offered every other year? I don't know yet. Um, but those are the kinds of things that we'll have to take a look at as we get through registration. But we're hoping that what this does is it gives you a little bit better idea of the thinking that we're doing, um, that things are a little bit clearer as part of this process. One of the things that we ask of you is if you see a third rail in here, if you see something in here that you say, oh my goodness, absolutely not. For instance, I showed you down here. These are the potential programs that could be affected under our dropout prevention program. So if there is something in there that's a, a dead stop uh, for you as a board, that's something that we need to know about as we get further into the process uh, because that helps us make sure that what we bring to you is a set of budget uh, uh, reductions that meet your expectations and allow us, our building administrators, and eventually our teachers to do their jobs. Steve, can I say one thing on that? Yeah. I think the one thing to be pay attention to with some of those support programs would be those would be people I think you hear from first or complaints you hear, and those are the needy students that you talk about. But I think for us, philosophically, the thing that Steve's brought to you a couple times is what we have to do well first is core instruction. And so those things are going to seem, they're all intervention-based things, right? They're to help. And they're all good things we do. And they're not, we, there's no way we can't say those are not important or that they're not helpful. But the more that we don't do there, and if you ask us to shift things out, then we're reducing more core staff. And that's our core instruction. That's the thing we have to get right first. Because if we downgrade our experience there, you might not hear from those things initially, but those are the things that have the long-term impacts that are harder to recover from that he was just talking about. So is there a role for the foundation here? Clearly, not going to get a $6 million deficit, but from a programming standpoint, they from a party could go raise money for a new building that doesn't have the same program that they're under drop profession. They're not going to go fund staff. Absolutely. Uh, 
so they could fund programs. The Workplace uh, Learning Connections uh, is a program that we run in cooperation with Kirkwood Community College. And, and something like that might be um, something that is appealing to the foundation right, exactly. because give you money it's the kind of ask that, that matches yeah. the types of things that they ask for. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, there are definitely things like that. We, Susan and I have had some tentative conversations about that. <coughs> You know, obviously, her first question was, don't bring me things that are six-figure and seven-figure budget items, uh, because those are things Definitely that are tough, six tough for them to raise. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah, there, she said that, again, the, the foundation has really moved from just asking for money to selling programs. We'd like yeah, you to sponsor School of the Wild. We'd like you to sponsor the visiting artist. And so some of the things here that fall in dropout prevention are those sponsor program type of things, mm -hmm. which are, are an easier lift for them when they reach out to the community. Can I sure need to know pretty darn quick though to start a campaign? Yep, we've talked about that. By April? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I share two things? Yeah. Um, like was alluded to with the secondary folks, um, you know, we have certain courses for offer and teach purposes that we have to have on the books. The other thing I would say and piggyback off of what Matt said with um, dropout prevention is um, just even in that shift of partial FTE of secondary counselors going in. Not only do we have the offer and teach piece, but we also have to abide by Iowa code. So certain positions are required for school districts as well. The ratios are sometimes suggested, that they're sometimes set forth for us, but that's something else that we're keeping in the backdrop as we do this work. And my one other thing that I just have to uh, make sure that everybody understands is where Steve has published the RAM and the five levels, that's um, some of our first earliest enrollment polls with the new projections with kids in power school all coded for the first time. So those are all live-in numbers. There's no kids that um, we have not officially changed any indicators of kid, kiddos that have um, met the exceptions for voluntary transfer yet. So those numbers will shift for sure. And as you look at the chart, one thing that I would also add to is if you look at it, uh, you may say that uh, it's interesting that it appears that kindergarten and first grade enrollment are the same at every school. And that's because we don't have kindergarten registration done yet. We don't have those numbers yet. Um, so our basis for our estimation for our kindergartners is the number of first graders that are in the live-in attendance area for that school. But that, if you go up to the top, and I, I'd encourage you to take a look at the right-hand side of that chart, because that's the summary page. Um, you'll see there that the cohort that, uh, uh, that we've estimated uh, for our current first graders at 1175 that we're using for our cohort for the uh, kindergartners is very similar to the cohort that you would see at second grade, third grade, fourth grade, et cetera. So, uh, it's right in line with those expectations. So again, this is where we are today, uh, and we wanted to make sure that you were up to speed and knew that we were working hard to re meet that mark of uh, that budget that comes in that's balanced, that uh, uh, meets the expectations that we have to comply with all the state budgeting rules. Um, we're trying to make the least bad decisions we can uh, out of the choices that are available to us. Uh, and we'd certainly welcome any input that you have as you think about it. Um, we'll be back in front of you every couple of weeks, just giving you an update on this. And, and uh, uh, if you've got uh, thinking on that that you want us to make sure that we include as part of this process, we would definitely welcome that. Can I just clarify one thing on the timeline? Yeah. Uh, well, one other point, too. And I mentioned it when I was talking about the reductions in force, and obviously we can't control what the state does. The governor can say what she wants to give, but then obviously you know the legislature has to fight it out and have to approve the budget. We don't have the luxury, given our current circumstance, to wait for that to happen. Um, we have a hard deadline from the state of April 30th where we have to notify teachers if we're going to uh, have a reduction in force. And so we kind of have to work back from there and thinking that when we come back from spring break, we're going to have to start having those difficult conversations about, hey, look, we're looking at maybe a true reduction. Brady's been great in the association with helping us try to get as much information collected as possible. And one of the new things we did um, was we sent, in, sent out what we called a teacher intention form and asked teachers to tell us what their plans were for next year. It's the first time we did it, uh, but actually we got a really good response. We have over um, 1,000 responses uh, from our 1,143 teachers. That's the good news, which means they're they're telling us uh, they're they're willing to share that information. <laughs> Would you leave with that's the good news? Yeah. Yeah. The bad news is um, only 41 have told us that they're not planning on returning to the next to the district next year. Uh, 41 is a familiar number because that's the exact number of retirements that we've got. <laughs> now I know that's not. 
Yeah, they're right. Really? Now, I know that's not exactly accurate. Like, Scott sent me an email today about a teacher that he knew was, uh, their family was going to make a move and move out of the district. So we know there's a couple. But even with those, the difference between the numbers of the retirements and then what Steve has shown you on the sheet and what we've calculated in my office is still 38. Right? So, so we have to look and, and try to work before. How many teachers again? I'm sorry? What's the total number of teachers again? 1,143. 1100? Yeah. You know, based on what Steve showed on that sheet, starting with that 42 number after the 41 or the 34 that taking retirement, we know of three or four more resignations. So that's still a 38 person gap between the number that we want to get to and where we are currently knowing through an attrition. And that's what we really want to do, right? Just hope that we do this through attrition that no one has to lose their job, that everybody wants to be included or employed by the school district this spring is still employed in the fall. It does. So, it does. Yeah, it does. And like I said, I included the, the seven uh, uh, special ed uh, staff openings that are there. Uh, I didn't factor them in from a budget standpoint. Um, people, Brady will remember this because he was part of it. Uh, the last time we went through this process, yeah. we did some involuntary transfers out of currently taught subject area into certified are certified certifiable subject areas um, so we did some involuntary transfers of people with the theory that we're going to move <coughs> from a position teaching X to a position teaching Y because you're certified to do that because there is enough transitionary turnover in the district that we'd rather keep you on the team in a different position so that when a position in your field opens up again we can move you back in there because you have the least seniority in that um, certification area so that's still an option for us. Um, we'll continue to keep that, uh, uh, keep working on that because one of the things that that does, to Chase's point, is, is uh, if possible, uh, we prefer not to have to go through a reduction in force to actual people. And my real point of bringing that up was to try to point out the urgency from a timeline situation. That um, you know, when we come back from spring break, we'll really sit down and probably have that first conversation with our first and second year teachers if the situation doesn't improve and say, by the way, you may be getting a notice from us in the next three weeks that you will not have a job in the district. And spring break's not that far away. I mean, it's, it's eight weeks. And so I think that just talks to, to where we are. Um, and we want to be as transparent as we can with our employees. We don't want to overly worry them, but I think it'd be, it wouldn't be very great of us either to pretend that we're not concerned about this. And one bit of good news, uh, those of you who have been around block, you know that the state has not always been really good about setting supplemental state aid. Um, they have been much more adamant about their intent to do so early in the process. Um, they've already taken up a couple of uh, education bills. They took up the personal finance bill through the House that would exempt uh, students uh, prior to the graduating class of 22, 23. That would help. Um, and uh, so that's off to the Senate right now. So uh, I'm hopeful that uh, with the governor's focus on education and her state of the state speech that uh, they actually take up supplemental state aid and get that done sooner rather than later. They've got other things that they want to move on. Uh, I, I think to do the first 30 days. Yeah, so. I think SAVE is supposed to be a part of that process. Now, remember, there's there's the that's law. not a binding <laughs> requirement, no. Brady. That is a recommendation. Laws are suggestions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, some of those things that are K-12 focused are actually done soon in the session and then that really helps us uh, firm up our picture. Yeah, Chase came to the Building Road Council and he did a fantastic job uh, just in talking through all of this. I think communication is just going to be, you know, critical. And I, I would say on behalf of, you know, the administrative team, you know, Matt and Amy and Craig and Stephen, uh, Chase have been working about up at the central office on all of these things. Just having known factors established is really important because there are a lot of things that we don't know. How many students are going to, and families will take advantage of the voluntary transfer. So that March 1st is, that's really, really tricky. So as a board, I would just say, you know, making, you know, having conversations, making decisions and saying, this is what we're going to go with because then we know those variables will really help these guys out. Otherwise, it, all of a sudden you keep having all these moving targets and it just is really, it's really, really hard to do. I would just say there was a time when reduction of force were common mm -hmm. and predictable. It was just the way it was operating procedure. Yep. And um, that's not been the case for so long. Nope. So yep. it's the, the work that they're doing is really key. 
the year because it just hasn't been a part of anybody's recent memory. Yeah. yeah. How many events have you Before I've been here. Yeah, I didn't. Okay. I know I went, I went through a process like Greg's talking about. It was just the way we did things in the 90s in Wisconsin yeah. in the early yeah. aughts. It just happened every year. You were a new teacher. You expected to get a pink slip. Yeah. It's just kind of the way things worked. Yeah. But that's not. And so, to Greg's point, that there will be a lot of angst in general uh, in that process. Oh, gosh, yeah. uh, crazy. Right. And, and there was a big focus last year to hire zero and first year oh, teachers. I mean, right. just an absolute locked in vision for that. Yeah. Yeah, I remember how great the opening session was. It was pouring down rain, and everybody was all happy and great. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. it's great. Well, I think that it's got your point, and we're kind of off topic, but. Ramifications from a budget situation this year go into the next couple of years. Not only from a money standpoint, but also from a climate and culture standpoint yes. and attracting oh, talent. And this idea that we're trying to expand how we recruit, who we recruit, people don't want to go places where they think they're going to lose their job. And so that's one of the reasons we're really trying to be transparent and engage employees yeah. because even though we're facing this, we're truly trying to ramp up engagement so people feel that they're valued so that when we can start hiring again, we haven't taken too many steps backwards. I mean, I had conversations with Greg and a couple others about great student teachers they have, student teachers of color that are in the district, that if we can find a way to get them here, we want to do that, but it's gonna be a challenge. So to that point, having a very credible story on how we got to this budget shortfall, if it's just like, oh, we don't know, or I mean, it's the revenue, uh, sorry, um, enrollment projections are the big factor. So how do we miss so badly? What happened? What were the trends? Can we continue, are we expecting them to continue? Or that was a one-off and here's why we believe that. I mean, having a credible story around that, I think is going to be important. Our biggest challenge, in, in all honesty, and I know I've shared this uh, with our legislators over and over again, and, and uh, you know, in, in nine years, we've had one year of uh, adequate allowable growth one year. Every other year there's been a structural deficit. So every time there's a structural deficit, and we're really good in public education. First of all, no one wants to go out and tell students or parents, hey, guess what? Things aren't going to be as good for you next year as they were this year. So we do a really good job of making the story as rosy as possible. And, and we've done that year over year over year, but at the same time in the back room when the door closes, we're short a couple million bucks. So we figure out a way. To find it. So maybe disappointed we've, we've reached we've the end of our. We've so hard yeah. because you never want to go out and say, hey, guess what? We can't do, we can't give you as good as what your brother had or your sister had or your cousin had or your parents had when they were a student here. Um, that, that's not but our I, DNA. But I, I still think crafting that message yep. so it doesn't sound defensive, so it, does, so mm -hmm. it sounds like we know what we're doing yep. and we know what to expect going forward and here's why. Um, to get the confidence in the team so that they, we don't see a flight. Yeah. Yeah. I think we did know some of that, right? I mean, we knew we were nine million years with Liberty Open, yeah. right? I mean, we knew that going in, the extent yeah. of it, with not as many kids coming in as we thought, but some inefficiencies added to it, to it some other stuff, right? So, I mean, it came up at the legislative forum. We were talking about the need for money, and I think Senator Volcom asked, so <laughs> how do you get to the point where you have a $6 million deficit that you got to deal with? It was. I don't think it was, but it kind of came out accusatory a little bit. And Steve fired right back, well, nine straight years of insufficient supplemental state aid. And I was hoping it was a question. Like, Otherwise, my answer wasn't yeah. very nice. <laughs> but, uh, but as we cut everything because of that persistent lack of funding, we've squeezed, optimized, and we're, we can't do that anymore. Right. I'm uh, saying you haven't made structural changes. You know, we're trying to run the same thing we tried to run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More yeah. Stuff. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. Just, there's not been a structural change. And to, 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 to complement the nine years of growth, then it's, it's going to get checked to us. Yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. I, I, I think somewhere in there, that's. Yeah. Those are radical changes that are going to be yeah. very, very hard. And you know what? The, the, one of the things that we can look to, and I, it'll behoove us to do that over <coughs> time, depending on what happens, is uh, we are one of the few districts in the state that's growing. Yeah. Uh, most districts are declining, and even most large urban districts. Cedar Rapids lost 200 kids this year. Uh, and so when you look at the large districts that are declining, or you look at the other districts across the state that are declining, 
you see those radical changes. Four-day school weeks, elimination of entire departments at the secondary level, um, enormous class sizes at the elementary level, things like that. Those are things we haven't had to deal with. But it, it, to your point, though, it would be in our interest to reach out and better understand what misery they've lived through so that we can understand what we <coughs> have to and what we may have to. I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to swing through this. Mm -hmm. Our enrollment's going to come back. We're going to get some decent supplemental state aid. Um, and, and we would be back to where we were a couple years ago in a couple years. It's how we weather that storm, That's right. keep our staff, keep our morale, keep our head up, keep our programs, yeah. and put us in a position that when the money comes back that we can add the things back that we've lost. Uh, in terms of Grant and Hoover, have you guys started hiring for that? And if so, is it only internal aspects? Right now we have hiring <coughs> freeze on, so all hiring that's going on is internal. So all the postings that go up, uh, it's moving people around. So at Hoover, we had an arrangement with the uh, ICEA, the people at Old Hoover that wanted to transfer to New Hoover could, so we've extended yeah. that to them. There were a couple of additional openings at the school, posted them internally. Those are internal movements from one school to another. Doing the same thing with Grant right now, one school to another. Uh, and uh, if you see any openings that are out there right now that are posted in the district, admin to custodian, right now everything is internal only. And what we're doing then is looking to fill the most key positions and then leave the vacancies at the end of that string of dominoes, recognizing that those are the positions that will fill as things come back. The, the only caveat is that in a week, you'll start seeing some external pop up just so we can maintain compliance with the IDEA. Yes. Steve did give us, yep. give me that directive. So, Special ed has some requirements yeah. for us to fill positions, and, and we can't, if someone doesn't apply internally, I can't leave them vacant. So we can post them internally, but if we don't get internal applicants, we've got to post externally. To but, comply with ID but only on the support side, no teachers, just on the para support side to get us through the, get us through the year. Yes. Is there still an expected little bit of staff movement from West to Liberty with next year having a full senior class? I think part of our 50 not, kids or something. We're not processing yeah. it the same way we have, but. I mean, obviously, you don't know who's us. So yeah. you know, these guys haven't seen this. My head. This will. We would talk to them about this at admin council next week, so they're seeing some of the reduction information for the first time. But I, and that's part. What of we'll have to do is look at reshuffling FTE potentially once we know some of these pieces. Chase was talking about about people leaving. Then we have to go department by department and say what kind of programming can we offer in the science across the district and what do we do in math and those are going to be conversations we'll have to have. And back to the original conversation with what all the kids are yeah. all the kids yeah. math, right? Yep. Right. But that's part of our normal secondary process, yeah. you know. We, we look at the where enrollments up and down and make those uh, adjustments accordingly. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, by the way. I didn't get to say this at the beginning, but thanks for being willing to flex your schedule. I've been watching the temperatures we're sitting in here and it's plummeting. Um, Negative so three, I think. Uh, I'm glad that I'm not releasing you at, uh, at three at, at uh, after eight o'clock tonight. So thanks for your flexibility. Uh, nope, that's not that <laughs> off. I moved here five minutes ago. <laughs> Mine's already warm, as I said. Uh, uh, five o'clock. That's an idea. 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 That's an idea.